Hi. Hello. Hello, y'all. It's Michael. Um, I just Hello. wanted to start off the vlog because I am going to go to this <coughs> to this author signing, and they're still here. <laughs> Peace. Hello. All right. So I'm about to go. Um, it's just gonna be like a couple minute drive, so it won't be that that bad. I had to make sure that first off I do have my camera and it is working I have my extra battery I have the actual book oh my gosh imagine if I went there and I don't have the book that would be sad but here it is yay so in case you don't know I'm gonna go see Jacqueline Woodson um, from the newsletter thingy that I saw apparently this book they had like 200 copies at their library system so they wanted everyone to read it and then now she's gonna be here she's gonna do a talk and then she's gonna do a book signing I should have also read um, her other book another Brooklyn so I would I should have got that one signed too but oh well so yeah first I'm gonna go I'm gonna try to go to a coffee shop first maybe because I do have some time I always enjoy going to coffee shops whenever I go to a different city so yeah I'm about to go now uh, listen to my audiobook while I'm driving over there All right, I got the orange blossom tea. It's pretty good. And now I have to rush over there because I'm kind of behind. Like, mm. Luckily, the place is really close by, so yay. I think I'm at the right place because I think I went to the other side of the building, um, but I think I know um, I'm at the right place because I see people with the same book, so I'm going in now. Jacqueline Wilson is the 2014 National Book Award winner for her New York Times bestselling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming which was also a recipient of the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Honor Award. Please welcome to the stage, Jacqueline Wilson.
stories of my life and the small moments in my life and every memory I had. When I got stuck, I, my plan had been to ask my mom what she remembered. And keep in mind that we were part of the Great Migration. So for those of you who don't know, the Great Migration started in the early 1900s and went to the mid to late 1970s where millions of black people left the very oppressive conditions of the South to come to places like New York City, Chicago, LA, Ohio, wherever they had family or wherever family had gone to before um, for better opportunities for themselves and for them, their children. So I'm a writer, I'm also, I also have a deep, deep love of my people and I also have a deep, deep love for social justice. And in the book, you'll notice that very often I say enslaved. I don't say slaves because the, the slavery was something that someone else did to our people. And I think it's really important that we use the language that tells the truth about the history of our country before, so that we can begin the healing process. To say someone was a slave says that that's, the onus is on that person. But to say someone was enslaved lets us know that someone wanted to do a certain thing to a certain people, and, and this is what that thing was. So I'm very conscious about language, because these stories won't always be here, and the history of our country is so rich, and the people who have lived that history have so much information, no matter who they are, no matter what color they are, no matter what their socioeconomic class, they have these stories to tell us, and we need to hear those stories, because once they're gone with them, those stories go. I was a really slow reader, and I had to read the same stuff over and over and over and over and over and over before it made sense. When I was growing up, we had um, what was called the SRAs, and for the older folks in the room, you know, they were this box of um, reading, this box of something, this box of I can't say the word, but um, but but and they were color coded, so they were a little comprehensive test, and they were they went from pale colors to really dark colors. And depending on what your reading level was, you were either reading the really pale ones or the dark ones. And my sister was always out the box because she was always getting praised for being brilliant. And I was always getting not praised and, um, and chastised for not reading fast enough. And, and so I would read the stories over and over. And by the end, I would have them memorized. But I know if I was growing up today, I would probably be labeled dyslexic. And, um, and I know now that what I was doing was I was reading as a writer. I was very engaged in the story. I was completely deconstructing it. And I was trying to understand how the author got me to feel the way the author got me to feel. I actually practiced both faiths and faiths in our house. And I didn't know until I was an adult, and that's how sheltered and naive I was, that they were separate in this way, but we grew up reading the Quran and we grew up reading the Bible. We grew up um, um, praying five times a day and um, we grew up not eating pork. We grew up um, with, with firm beliefs from both religions. We grew up not celebrating any holidays. I think part of it was my family didn't think there was enough religion in the house and they were going to <laughs> make sure <laughs> we were indoctrinated in something. And I think also, um, it was a way to, we grew up with not a lot of money. Um, and witnesses don't celebrate holidays. Uh, and what my mother would bring us presents kind of randomly, but we were, we were very, from a very young age, taught that we were in this world, but we were not a part of the world. And for me as a writer, it served me greatly to be able to constantly be on the outside looking in. Um, and I think in terms of, having so much of religion in your house, especially we would go to the Kingdom Hall and I would be bored. And boredom, boredom was, is a good thing for writers because then the stories start coming. I always threaten my kids with it now. In our house, there were a lot of rules. And we had very, very limited television and um, we had limited music. The thing that my mom didn't limit, which I was very grateful to her, for our books. We, no book was ever censored. So, and she made sure that our library card was always active and up to date. I remember I had taken a book called American Negro Poetry, and it was a collection of poems. I, I was thinking of 
one the other day. It's a poem by County Cullen. Um, Your world, you know that poem? Your world is as big as you make it. I know for I used to abide in the narrowest nest in a corner, my wings pressing close to my side. But I sighted a distant horizon where the skyline encircled the sea, and I burned with a throbbing desire to travel this immensity. I cradled my wings, I, I, I battled the cordons around me and cradled my wings on a breeze, then soared with the uttermost reaches with rapture, with vigor, with ease. Both American Negro poetry had all of these great poets from Langston Hughes to Audre Lorde to County Cullen to the D.J. Body. So I kept it. Um, and then <laughs> I hid it in my house forever. And you know, the librarian knew my mom because we spent so much time at the library. And I was like, I don't know where that book is. So and I still have it to this day with all my little scratchings in it from when I was a kid. But, but my mother, you know, I ended up, of course, paying for it because my mother was mortified that one of her children would lose a book. When I was the teacher, Miss Vivo, who said you're a writer, uh, was really encouraging for me. Also, in 11th grade, I had a teacher, Mr. Miller, who was great. But in, in grade school and in high school, high school more so, they let me be the editor of the literary magazine that we had for my high school. And it was basically the Jacqueline Woodson magazine, because I only published like two other people besides myself. <laughs> Mildred Taylor, Tony Morrison, Nikki Giovanni, um, you know, Eloise Greenfield, all the writers where I was able to see a reflection of myself in the narrative. I think it was it's so important, and I was talking to teachers about this today, um, for young people to have mirrors, to have reflections of themselves in the books they read, in the shows they watch, in the you know, conversation they hear, because um, because it, it legitimizes them in a bigger world. I was talking about in terms of mass incarceration. My uncle was in prison. I knew other people who had incarcerated um, family members, black and white, and it was a shameful thing to talk about. Meanwhile, we have mass incarceration going on, and we have all these kids who are uh, who can't talk about members of their family that they adore. And that's why I wrote Visiting Day. I wanted um, to begin the dialogue, but there is no shame having an incarcerated family member. It's, it's just a part of what's happening in this country, and it's so much a part of so many things. I say Negro, I say colored, I say black, I say African American. I don't know if I say people of color, but, but because that the language is constantly changing, I wanted to go with the color of my skin. And, and so I think I'm saying black girl dream, we would have dated it in 20 years if we weren't calling ourselves black anymore, if we were just saying people of color, then I would have been girl of color dreaming. Or if I look back to when we were top, um, we were Negro. Yeah, so, so I, so I wanted to get away, away from all the political ramifications behind the way we, uh, we as people of color and white people addressed us. And again and again, people call it black girl dreaming. I'm like, no, it's brown girl dreaming. This is about a brown girl dreaming. Also, in terms of a brown girl dreaming. Um, it's, it's, it's much more universal. Brown girls are Indian. Brown girls are, you know, um, Southeast Asian. Brown girls are Asian. Brown girls are Latina. You know, brown girls are African American. Brown girls are biracial. And there, there's, it's speaking to anyone who's ever had a dream, and for me specifically as a brown girl. You have to be reading poetry. If you're writing spoken word, you have to be listening to spoken word. If you're writing fantasy, you have to be reading fantasy. If you're writing realistic fiction, you have to be reading realistic fiction. You cannot write if you're not reading. It, it's just not going to happen. Or you can write and it'll not be good writing. So, um, so that's, and for me, when I get stuck, when I feel like I, <laughs> I can't get the story back, I go back out. I go back and read the writers that I've read before that I love. And they really help me unlock my own stories. And that's why I say reading is so important. Thanks, everyone. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. I actually have a YouTube channel. I was, I was talking about one of your books, uh, this book actually last year. Yeah. What is it? Uh, no, well, Brown Girl Dreaming. No, but what is your channel? Uh, Michael Reads. Oh. I talk about books. Oh, I'm going to find you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, I don't know if you can see me, but <laughs> yay, I got a sign. It's so cool. Whew. Usually I don't... Okay, where am I? Okay. Usually I don't get nervous, but I don't know. I was nervous around her. I didn't even say anything. I don't know if you can see me to be honest, but yes, oh, that was so nice of her. I doubt she'll follow me on my channel. That was a really fast conversation. I don't know, I really got nervous. Usually I'm really talkative around people, but I don't know, she got me nervous, y'all. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna go home now, because um, it's getting pretty late, so I'm gonna have work tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop by some place to eat, but I'll see you when I get home. Hey guys, I go to this place too much, like seriously, too much. All right, okay, this is going to be my goodbye clip. Basically, I'm just gonna eat, um, I got fried rice and then fish and some, um, some wings. Oh my gosh, you guys, I go to this place all the time. Like, it's actually really sad. <laughs> but yeah, let me show you the book. So I got a bookmark uh, from there and then she signed it. Right here. Nope. You take this off. Okay, yeah, it just says Michael, so cool meeting you. <laughs> so cool. Okay, yeah. I can't think of an author that I actually, um, like, like, that I read and I actually met them and got their autograph, so yeah, I, I, I don't think I can recall one, but I think this is my first official one, so yay. Uh, I had a good time. It was really. It was really fun seeing her talk and um, talk about her book and her life, so. I'm tired. Uh, it's because since they're an hour behind us, some t yeah, because, you know, 10 o'clock is my bedtime. So, yeah, until then, you guys, I'll see you guys till later. Bye!